All right, welcome everybody. We are at the top of the hour and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to NetDevOps Live. My name is Hank Preston and I will be your host. As you've heard, Kevin Corbin is gonna be back and he's gonna be presenting for us today on designing and developing network services with Cisco NSO. We've talked a bit about NSO in season one and we're gonna dive deeper into what it's possible as it goes through. As always, if you have questions during today's session, please use the Q&A panel inside of WebEx events. I'll be monitoring the question panel and answering them throughout today's session. If you're interested in grabbing the slides or sample code or the resources Kevin's going to go through, those are already posted up on NetDevOps Live in the webinar resources for today's episode, and I'll post a link to that momentarily in the chat. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Kevin to take us away. Thanks. Hey guys, thanks for joining and Hank, thanks for having me back. Uh, today we're gonna to talk about designing and developing network services with NSO. I'm Kevin Corbin. I don't know what my title is exactly these days, so I uh, stole a, a little funny humorous title here from Carl Moberg, who's one of the leaders of the NSO product team. And uh, we'll just get started here. Uh, before we get, before we do, uh, Hank would really appreciate it if you guys let him know that uh, you appreciate all the hard work that goes into uh, producing and, and scheduling these webinars. So head on over to cs.co slash NDL and help us track the fact that you're interested in it and uh, so we can use that input to um, you know, figure out what other topics are interesting to you and get uh, the best content in front of you that we possibly can. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to start with doing a quick NSO overview and review. And then we're gonna dive right into developing NSO service packages, which is how we really harness the power of the framework and customize it to impose our will into our network automation systems. Uh, in doing so, we're gonna kinda of take a little bit different spin on Yang. Uh, there's been a number of, of uh, content that, that we put out there about Yang and, and data models and such. I'm gonna to try to kinda of dissect it a little bit. Uh, this is a topic that I personally uh, struggled with quite a bit and, and NSO was really kind of what helped me get a better understanding of Yang. So I'm going to kind of try to walk you guys through that. And then we'll talk about some of the aspects of how you go about designing service packages and, and developing those service packages. And as always on these sessions, we're going to do a good deal of demo and, and actual kind of coding and, and show you what goes into this. So without further ado, you know, you'll recall from the previous season, we were on here and we talked about NSO as being the single kind of network-wide API and CLI. And if you, if you didn't catch that session, I'd highly recommend going back and, and looking at the recording. But, but effectively, what NSO provides is this way to give us a Yang-based configuration database um, and some other components that help us with sort of our tedious day-to-day -day job of, you know, making sure that our devices are in sync with how we think they should be configured, uh, and then for giving us operations that allow us to sort of remediate when they go out of compliance in the form of sync from and sync to. But more importantly, what NSO provides is this northbound API that's rendered from that database, uh, exposing all of our multi-vendor devices into this single northbound API that's consistent regardless of whether we're using the CLI, which itself is a northbound API, the web UI, which you know, we all sort of have some use cases where we still need that kind of graphical interface, or some of the REST API and kind of the more programmatic interfaces to it. And the thing that I like best about this is that you know, we're all undergoing a transition in the networking world, which is we're, we kind of grew up in the CLI and, and we know that very, very well, but now these sort of new interfaces and new requirements are coming down on us to do you know, more scripting and more automation. And I think one of the powers of NSO is our ability to help you kind of make that transition yourself and we get kind of this you know, choice of interface. So if I'm the network engineer and I like the CLI, I can continue to use the CLI. It's a, a first class citizen in this. But at the same time, when I hand you know, my services that I've developed off to say my ServiceNow team, I can present them with a the REST API that they can use to, to invoke the same operations or provision services uh, with a format that's a little bit more friendly than them. And it, in all of these cases, what we're really trying to do here is we're trying to automate. We're trying to manage our device configurations, and we're trying to produce a, a higher quality service that we're delivering back to our business or whoever our, our consumer is. 
And we want to think about automation throughout the full life cycle, not just how do we provision a service, but maybe how do we go in and modify existing services that we're providing. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've had a lot of approaches that take kind of the CLI scripting notion where, you know, we're sort of at the mercy of the device vendor and, and anything that they may change in that CLI and that could cause us to kind of have to go back and refactor our scripts. Uh, and so on and so forth. So this model-based approach, you know, we certainly think is a much better way of thinking about network automation. And from, a, from an NSO itself's perspective, again, last season we talked sort of from the southbound side down into this abstracted device layer that's provided through what's called a network element driver or a NED for short. Um, and certainly the ability to kind of have, you know, this sort of multi-domain, multi-vendor network that's model driven, you know, end to end, and we can centralize our policy and services in the form of our configuration database, so on and so forth. For this session, what we're going to look at is kind of what are we exposing to the northbound of this in, in the form of our service management layer, as well as our package manager, because one of the strong things about NSO is that at the end of the day, NSO is an application server. And that application server, we, we, we extend the functionality of that in the way of these packages that we're going to dive into uh, you know, throughout the remainder of today's session. So what is a package, right? And a package comes in a couple of different forms with a couple of different consumption models. We've already introduced you to the first type of package, which is the network element driver. And this is the way that we model a particular network device um, and how that thing gets managed, whether it's you know, through a modern API or whether it's through an SSH or Telnet session that we would you know, uh, go into and issue commands and, and you know, in the form of config commands or show commands to sort of see what the state of that device is. Um, services are what we're gonna focus on today, which is where we define something that the network provides, right? So a lot of these configurations on the discrete devices are sort of meaningless without the full context of why are we putting that configuration there and what's the, the product that we're providing back to our consumer. And then there's sort of a third category, which is a catch-all where it's not necessarily a, a device driver and it's not necessarily a service, but we wanna sort of have these utilities that go along with it. So things like, hey, I wanna go out and discover all of the devices in my network, or maybe integration in with an IPAM system or, or, or something like that. We kind of categorize those in this you know, third tools category. For all of these packages, whether it's network element drivers, services, or tools, there's kind of two ways that we think about the models themselves. One is the customer facing service. So what is the stuff that our customers care about? What is it that they want to order from us? And then we also have it in terms of the resource facing services, which is the stuff that sort of as network people we care about, right? They're not necessarily a direct translation to you know, what is uh, you know, being ordered or what's being provided by the network, but they're important things that we have to manage as part of kind of the core versus context discussion. And then finally, there's also another sort of consumption model in this, which is how do we get these, right? And, and there, this kind of falls into the classic build versus buy discussion, right? So today we're gonna focus uh, you know, pretty heavily, almost exclusively on what goes into building these services ourselves or developing these services ourselves. But we also have this notion of a core function pack, which is for a large number of our customers, there's things like SD-WAN or, or network function virtualization, or you may be first familiar with Secure Agile Exchange, where these are services that Cisco or our partner ecosystem has developed, and you can buy them kind of in an off-the-shelf uh, uh, you know, type of manner. Now, again, because this is a DevNet and DevOps live session, we're, we're gonna focus on sort of the development side of this and, and talk about what goes into that. And before we do, I think it's important to take a look at why would we want to develop? Why wouldn't we just want to buy these things off the shelf from some vendor and, and trust that they know sort of what they, they want to do? And, and uh, we've got a little cartoon over here because, you know, at the end of the day, again, this is a DevNet session and we're all developers now. And I got a good kick when I was sort of scouring the Googles for some funny images here. This is a, a way to troll art your developers. And, I take a look at that blog and you got a few minutes, It's a, you'll get a good laugh out of some of them. This is the one where they say we're gonna eliminate access to Stack Overflow, which I think we all know we would be lost without. But um, 
getting back to getting back on script here the, the main reason that we want to develop our own services is because it provides us the ability to create an abstraction between any of our devices and any of our vendors and how they think about the world and allow us to represent those things in the context of our business and our standards and our processes and our procedures instead of the way that somebody else thinks that we should configure our network. The second reason is, is and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is we want to also integrate in with these other systems, right? Network automation isn't creating some new process or some new way of doing things. It's about codifying what it is that we do on a daily basis. And that has you know, tentacles into things like DNS or IPAM or our change management database or some sort of ITSM system. And so we want to integrate our automation work, our automated workflows into those systems as well. And developing services allows us to, you know, pick and choose those systems that we use versus relying on a vendor to provide a, a native integration with your DNS server or your IPAM system. You know, maybe it's an off the shelf, very common one. Maybe it's something that's homegrown that nobody else knows about. And so nobody else could sort of develop that integration besides you and your organization. In all of these cases, though, what we're talking about is enforcing, again, our policy, our constraints, and our standards, and at the same time, you know, making sure that when we deploy, we follow all of those, but then in the cases where, for whatever reason, we've strayed from those policies and we're out of compliance, it also, the, developing this as a service model also apply, allows us to quickly De determine whether or not all of our devices and all of our services are in fact in compliance and when they're not we can easily remediate them and bring them back into our standards. Another reason that we want to sort of get into this higher level thing is that we you know as we build them up and you think about that difference between uh, uh, you know a, a resource facing service and a customer facing service Particularly at the resource facing service, there's some of these common things that are shared across multiple services that we're exposing to the customer. And we, we lack a lot of visibility into why is a particular piece of configuration on a particular device and what would the impact be or what services might be adversely affected if I make a change to that. So by having that, that abstraction between the devices and our services, we can also sort of look into it and inspect to say, where are those mappings and, and what are the interdependent services and configurations? And then ultimately we wanna to get to, we wanna accurate deployment across the entire life cycle, right? So as customers start to think about automation, early on there's a very heavy focus on how do we push a new configuration or a new service out into the network, but that's only sort of the smallest and easiest part of the battle. The, the harder part is for a given service, I deploy it today, you know, in sort of my day zero or day one type of dependency, but then the business might say, well, you know, this service that you're providing me is so great, I want to, you know, double my order and I want to get, you know, more ports or, uh, you know, more network constructs into that same service. And we don't want to have to write an entire new workflow to add something to an existing service or decommission a you know a particular port in a service that's being provided and all of these things go into sort of why we want to go ahead and develop these and this is where again we are imposing our will on the technology and our will includes all of that policy and constraint stuff so after we've decided that we're going to develop a service we look at okay what goes into a service package and, and the service package follows a, a, a strict separation of concerns between you know, the different aspects of all of the things that go into the service. The first and most important is the Yang or the data model that goes along with this. And this is the equivalent in, in network automation of what we call kind of the API first mentality where we're defining what is the API of this service going to look like? What's the CLI going to look like? And what are those constraints in very, very high level terms? We're not speaking about any particular device or type at this. This is what is the customer want to consume abstracted at, at whatever level we feel is appropriate for our consumers. And, and that may be multiple consumers with multiple different sort of models that go along with how they think about it. The second layer of this is 
sort of a logic layer. And this is optional, but we'll touch on it a little bit here today. And this is either Python or Java or maybe even Erlang code that goes in to say, okay, well, I'm gonna ask the user for a certain set of parameters by which I'm gonna to use to provision the service, but I may not want to expose all of the nitty gritty details to them because some of that information may need to come from those external systems that we're integrating in with. And so we can write very, very simple, you know, again, Python, I'm a Python guy, so we'll stick with the Python analogies here. Um, Python code that then goes out and makes those calls into external systems and gathers whatever information or computes, you know, naming standards or things like that into there. And, and this is again, where the kind of policy and governance stuff kicks in. Uh, we, then we have a, a template layer, which is where we're saying, okay, now from a networking engineering perspective, this service in these kind of high in the pie in the sky abstract terms does in fact need to be rendered down onto one or more device types. And so how do we go about doing that mapping and saying, okay, well, it's an abstract, you know, regardless of the vendor or vendor agnostic sort of input parameter, but that ultimately does need to get put into some sort of vendor specific semantics and templates are the way that we do that. Uh, the next component of a service package is the package metadata, right? And this is very akin to in Python, like a requirements.txt. So what's the minimum version of NSO that we require? Are there any other packages that this, this uh, uh, automation that we're developing is, is dependent upon? And, and then gives us some mechanics by doing so. There's some mechanisms in there to sort of automatically collect and, and rake in all of those dependencies into your project. Uh, without having to do a lot of kind of manual and tedious labor. And then finally, there's the test aspect of it. Because we're you know, software developers here, we want to follow good software development practices and generate unit tests for our services that can make sure that they're working uh, you know, properly prior to the first order being taken and, and uh, you know, going out and trying to provision this. Now, I, I like to point out here, there's also kind of a second avenue of testing that can go into these service packages as well. And, the first is sort of that unit test for the service and as we're developing these we want to make sure and have a way that we can quickly iterate uh, you know and make sure that our service package is developed correctly but then also secondarily there's a test aspect of it that says okay now i have a service that's been deployed through my service package how do i go about going out and collecting operational statistics and show commands from the devices to make sure and test that the service was in fact deployed correctly. And we kind of refer to this in a lot of cases as the services birth certificate. So after it's initially provisioned, go out, validate that the automation actually worked. And all of these combine to get us to the point where we can config, deploy, and validate with all of our organizational standards, processes, and best practices. Now, I introduced a lot of new terms in there and maybe some things that are foreign to you here. And, and uh, Hank, I didn't know whether you knew this or not, but this is actually a picture of me when I first started looking at Yang and some of the data model stuff and some of these terminologies that, uh, that I just mentioned here. So I wanna kind of take one small step back and kind of dissect some of the things and give a little bit of a double click on some of the things that we talked about. So what is Yang, right? And again, there's a lot of resources out there, but but there's kind of a multi-dimensional thing to Yang where it's this language that we can write and we can write code in Yang and, and it sort of resembles, a, I, I kind of think it feels a lot like a groovy uh, language. Uh, it's you know, or a, a hybrid between JavaScript and, and some other language. Um, but it's a standard as well. So you can have these Yang models that are published for a device type or by a vendor or by a software uh, package that you might use that describes what it is that that system does. And in a lot of cases, these Yang models or uh, you know, Yang itself is sort of open sourced. I can go out to GitHub uh, you know, in the Yang organization and I can see standard IETF models, open config Yang models that describe common elements that go into a network. So we've talked about services too, and we'll kind of double click on what's the customer facing service, right? And I think about that customer facing service in terms of why are we here and why do we have a job? We have a job because somebody wants to use something that we're providing, and in this case, that's the customer and this is the customer facing service. We also have that resource facing service, which is who has to manage it, right? And, and I think about these in terms of sort of the top down, what is the, uh, you know, the customer want, 
And these are, you know, dependent upon your environment and your requirements. These may be something as simple as, you know, a VPC or an L3 VPN from more of a networking concept. Uh, but they could also be, you know, more business related. Like, hey, we need to spin up an entire new branch in our organization. And that's a service that the network team or the network automation team provides. When you sort of dissect those customer facing services, there's the technical details that go into, you know, how are we managing this? How are we building it? And this is kind of a more of a bottom up approach. Uh, you know, things like, hey, I've got a PE router in an MPLS cloud in a, in a data center, I might have a distribution switch or an entire fabric. I might also have some things that, again, are sort of important, but, but kind of context, like I have compliance requirements for this is in a DMZ or it needs to maintain PCI or STIG compliance. And there's also these other kind of keeping the lights on things like SNMP or, uh, um, you know, what are the sort of mom and apple pie stuff that we think about when we, when we think about network management in general. And some of these might be services that we've developed and some of these might be those open standards based config models. Like here, I've got an example of sort of the open config VLAN model. Well, if the open config VLAN model meets all of your requirements, great, let's not create more work for ourselves and develop a service that's already available there in the you know, open source or, or standards based uh, um, you know, ecosystem. And then so when we talk about what is a model, and I'm going to kind of use an analogy here of a house, right? So when we think about this in terms of our models, well, when we're buying a house, we can look at the pictures online and we can sort of see this, you know, nice rendering of what goes into a house. But being that we're sort of, you know, having to provide this, there's a lot more that, ne that the customer doesn't necessarily see. So in this example, we've got the plumbing in the house, right? The buyer of the house doesn't necessarily care about what the layout of the piping inside of the house is. They more care about what are the faucets that go into the sinks and, and what are the, you know, what are the shower heads look like in that plumbing system. But both are equally as important and you can't have one without the other. So as we start to dissect this, we say, okay, well, it's not just a model. This ends up being a number of models that we're composing together into that customer facing service such that we can provide the product exactly like the customer wants. And this brings us to the sort of granularity of this, which is probably the harder part of it to get a, you, kind of your head around as you start to develop it, because it's very easy to say, I want to provision that MPLS VPN and starting from the MPLS VPN layer or that kind of top down, I then necessarily have to break that down into the smaller subcomponents, but I can flip the script and look at it a different way that says, okay, well, I have one big model that represents a MPLS VPN and it has subcomponents, but then as I continue to start to scale this thing, I may choose to break those models for a PE router or for a distribution switch out into their own separate model such that they're reusable across multiple projects. I may use that distribution switch or that PE router for several different customer facing services and I don't want to maintain a code base that says, you know, how, you know, I have to permutate every time the, the slightest difference in the, the overall customer facing service. So the orchestration layer in the context of NSO is what's responsible for that composition of these various models into that final product that the customer uh, you know, would ultimately want to consume. So sticking with a kind of our house analogy here, when you think about building a house, we have you know, a carpenter and we've got plumbing that's very important and we're all still working for a living. So we likely have a mortgage component that goes into it. And on its face, these things may or, you know, maybe seem slightly unrelated, but ultimately they are all required. And because we all work in technology, you know, the, the, the next most critical thing in our house is our internet service, but that's broken down into the full internet model and then sort of our on-ramp through our ISP. And, and you can kind of see how these things bubble up into creating kind of that final product. And then the key here is that that top model describes what it is that the customer actually wants to consume and the lower subcomponents or intermediate resources are then reusable across multiple different permutations that we might offer different customers or different consumers. And so what you really end up with 
is this sort of ecosystem of these models. And we talk about, you know, what, what goes into creating those. And again, some of them might be standards based, some of them may be provided by a vendor. And then hopefully the higher you get to the actual customer facing service, that's where you've really put your organization and your personal touch onto these other more generic models. So let's talk about our development environment. And again, the developer experience of NSO is one of the things that really has kind of gravitated me towards NSO and that it's made, they've made it very, very easy for you to start to create these service packages. So starting kind of from the top here, we have the ability to locally on my laptop, I can create a, a, a parity, you know, on parity instance of NSO running right in my local development environment. They've also provided the NetSim component, which is, we, we talked about that on previous sessions as well. This is a multi-vendor network simulator, which allows me to develop services that may need to touch you know, hundreds or even thousands of devices, but without actually having to have a full on test bed for me to, to test the automation against. I can do that all locally on my laptop. There's also a utility that comes with NSO called the NCS Make Package uh, utility, which allows me to generate code skeletons as a starting point for me when I'm going to develop this. So I don't have to write all of my code from scratch. I can generate a code skeleton and then start to tweak, uh, you know, all of the individual components that I care about. There's a number of dev tools that can be enabled on top of the NSO instance running on your local laptop that enable you to do things like, hey, I've got a query of the database, or maybe I want to do some sort of XPath expression to, to uh, enforce some constraint, and I have a, a, an, a, an environment right on my local NSO instance that I can do that. Uh, there's also a, a number of kind of CLIs and things where I can get the, the chance to sort of evaluate. I made a change in my code. What are the downstream impacts that that's going to have on my templates, uh, on all of my other services or those XPath queries for, for querying the database? Um, there's very, very robust logging framework. So again, we're not having to reinvent the wheel and, and factor in a lot of log uh, you know, frameworks into our projects by developing on the NSO platform we can just subscribe to the logging service that's provided by the platform. And then there's a full testing framework provided by Lux that allows us to do our unit testing um, uh, for our services. So how do we get started? We, there's a couple things that we do. First, I mentioned this before, we're gonna use that NCS package utility to create that service skeleton or the boilerplate code that goes into it. And there's a couple different components to it, right? We specify where do we wanna put these packages. And on an NSO server, there's going to be a packages directory. And inside that packages directory, you guessed it, that's where we're going to land our packages. And we're gonna pass it a service skeleton flag that says, hey, we're generating some new service. And then we have a choice of what is it that we want the, the skeleton to look like. And in this case, we're showing a Python and template. So remember that Python here is going to be that logic layer where we can write native Python to do sort of any computation or external calls that we need to, to gather information uh, to ultimately provision our service. And then finally, we're just passing it, hey, what's the package name that we wanna call this thing? And that becomes important because what starts to happen here is you're setting the stage for what are the um, uh, the things that are, you know, what's this thing called in terms of how are we going to reference it in our API and what's that data model going to look like. The next important thing here after we've ge generated this skeleton is that because these are uh, Yang models and because there is a database schema, when we add a package to NSO, we're actually extending that database schema such that we're accounting for these new data, this, the new data and the new types of data that we're gonna be putting into it based off of our service description. And so we have to compile those. And, and so that compilation is going to make sure that number one is gonna do kind of, kind of some linting or, or static code analysis that says, hey, your, your Yang is not syntaxed properly. And, and so we will we'll abort then as opposed to trying to run automation that could potentially have uh, you know, bad data into it. So whenever we change that model, the basic database schema, 
we need to recompile these modules. And, and again, the, the framework provides all of the utilities to, to help you do that very, very quickly and make sure that you kind of have the guardrails up that you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot because you've got a you know, missing semicolon in your, in your Yang model. Um, and so whenever that model changes, we recompile. And then whenever we change the template or logic, we have to reload our packages as well, which brings us to the next point is then inside of the NSO system, after we've compiled it, then we sort of reload the system and it, it makes available for use all of our new models here. So now you can see that we've got the, the VLAN model available here. I also have some device specific models that get uh, or packages in the form of NEDs that get reloaded. And again, this is they're all sort of packages, but we kind of think about them differently, whether they're a service or whether they're a device or whether they're a tool. So now we're all, you know, we're all kind of network config guys, network engineering guys. You say, okay, well, where does this device configuration come from? And that comes in the form of templates. These templates are XML files and they get stored in the template subdirectory of our NSO instance. Um, and the reasons for XML are, uh, you know, it, it gives us a, another layer of protection to make sure that by, by having it in an XML schema that's representative of the service configuration as well as our device configurations, we can make sure that once the templates are rendered, uh, uh, you know, inside of the system or prior to rendering them to the devices, we can actually validate that the data is correct. You know, some of the other templating languages that are out there, uh, you know, Jinja comes to mind or something like that, right? We can render it and we can see that, okay, it put output in, but we have no way of guaranteeing whether that, that is in fact valid output for a particular device type. In the XML uh, instance of this though, we get that validation and make sure that we can do uh, uh, you know, that operation on a particular device type before we actually attempt to do it on the device type. Now, we're not proposing and, and certainly hope that you're not spending a whole lot of time writing these XML files from scratch because again, we're a model-based system. We have device configurations that are stored natively on the device and we have those device configurations represented in the configuration database on NSO. So what we can do is we can actually kind of a, a pretty standard pattern that we find in, in automation is that you kind of have this golden device out here that has the desired state configuration and we can use that golden device to actually generate those XML files uh, for us uh, without having to do a lot of the, the particulars of the XML syntax and, and schema that goes into it. And then of course, like any good templating language, we have processing instructions. And, and we'll, we'll talk about those processing instructions here in just a little bit. Um, but the other thing that goes into these templates is variables, right? So we're collecting you know, some input from the customer uh, in terms of the service model that we've represented. And then we also have that logic layer where we might have computed or retrieved something in Python that get combined into the template. And both of these are valid sources for us to use inside of the template to substitute out some of those you know, parameters that we put into the XML file that we generated. Uh, and then finally, we end up with an XML file which can be pushed down to the, the, the devices and, and whichever vendor types are, are kind of there. I mentioned these template processing instructions. And these are, uh, you know, the documentation that comes with NSO is actually really good. This is a screenshot right out of the, the documentation there that says, you know, how do we, you know, go ahead and use this, right? So, you know, the most common pattern is sort of the loop one where we say, hey, I've got you know, 10 devices and I need to do something to all of those 10 devices. So I might use something like a for loop or a for each loop here that says, you know, for each device that my model is going to touch, iterate over that and make a particular config change. Uh, you know, I also have some conditional statements and, and some other sort of contextualized things to, to copy and maybe back up the configuration prior to making changes. And I can, I can impose all of that, that in right into the template itself. Um, and I got a link here for you. If you, you get download that free evaluation of uh, NSO, you can check out this documentation yourself there. But let's kind of take this back to more a more practical matter, and, and we're going to transition into kind of the demo aspects here. But before we talk about what we want to do from an automation standpoint, let's let's take an actual use case from sort of the real world. And it ends up that VLAN provisioning is sort of the hello world of, of network automation and programmability. 
So let's talk a little bit about what network automation you know, looks like or what we do today, right? So we think about this in terms of AVLAN as being this atomic thing that we manage. But in practice, what happens is then we immediately go down into all of these device specific configurations to say, well, the, the VLAN configuration ends up being the sum of the configuration relevant to that VLAN on X number of devices. And, and that's kind of the, the standard practice for today in network engineering. But, but when you stop and think about that for a second and ask yourself, well, now what is the source of truth for how a VLAN is configured. We can only arrive at that source of truth by somehow collecting these config snippets off of a bunch of different interfaces and a bunch of different devices, and then sort of you know check all of that configuration against something somewhere you know, that, that is, is usually lacking in a lot of environments. So when we talk about service development, we say, what if we want to kind of pull the Jack Johnson on this and turn that whole thing upside down, right? Because we think about a VLAN in terms of a, a, an atomic thing that we want to provision, let's configure it that way. And let's impose the way that we think about a VLAN into our model about how we do it. And in doing so, if on the left-hand side of the screen, you're a CLI guy like I am, I can create my own CLI that maps exactly to how I provision VLANs in my environment. And at the same time, because we're model driven, I can render a northbound interface, or API interface or REST interface in this case, where somebody might use curl commands or integrate in with ServiceNow using this REST API. But you can see the, the two side by side and see that they are very, very consistent. Obviously, one of them is in a little bit more of a you know, free form CLI syntax, whereas the one on the right hand side is in a, a JSON syntax that's good for serializing that data over the wire. Uh, but again, it's consistent and I get to describe how I want to think about configuring a VLAN. And I think that's the most important piece of it. So let's dive in and take a quick peek at what this might look like in practice here, right? And, and I went back and forth on whether we were gonna do some sort of live coding thing here or whether we were going to actually kind of just show you guys some code. I erred a little bit on the side of the ladder. So I have a link here and we'll provide this in the, in the show resources too, but this is the GitHub repository for the code that we're going to work on. And, and I will point out that one of the things that I tried to do here in this repository, in lieu of that full code walkthrough, I tried to maintain a very, very complete history of all of the steps that I took in the forms of the commit. So you, you know, if you go back to my initial commit, there's not gonna be much there. And then you can see that we'll kind of do a little bit of this walkthrough on how we generate the boilerplate. But then you can quickly dig into, okay, I generated that boilerplate config or that code, but then here are the exact parameters that I went in to change to sort of make this thing my own. And maybe I kind of delete some of the stuff that were, you know, you can see here that they create this dummy, you know, uh, leaf for me and I, I don't necessarily want that. So I, I just start to kind of customize it and make it my own. And that follows all the way through, you know, what the stuff that we are going to, uh, to show here today. Um, so let's dive in and first kind of look at this from the user's perspective, right? And so I mentioned before that I'm a CLI guy, so I'm gonna actually start off in the NSO CLI here. And I'm gonna show that, that for, for starters, I have con, you know, config commands or show commands that are pretty uh, um, you know, uh, familiar to me as a CLI guy, and I don't have any VLAN commands here. But the first thing that we see is in config mode, I have a VLAN uh, model that's available to me here somewhere. I must have missed it. Oh, there it was. So you can see here, I've got this VLAN option here in my context sensitive help by just doing a question mark that says, hey, I can manage L2 VLAN services. So let's take a quick break away from the CLI here and take a peek at the code that goes into developing or that goes into providing this CLI. So this is the Yang model for our VLAN service here. And you can see immediately I get this kind of these keys that say, hey, the tail F info. Well, I'm populating that help in the CLI or whatever API I happen to be using directly from the service model that I've defined. 
I've created a list of VLANs, right? That I'm gonna have multiple of these. So it's in fact a list of these things. Each one of them, I want the user to provide me with a name. And there's RFCs that we can provide in the show links that tell you about all these sort of Yang constructs. But it's a very, very simple and elegant language for describing network connectivity, such that I say, give me this name, and that's gonna in fact be a unique name because I have it as a key value, right? So I wanna make sure that no two things can be called the same uh, and create any confusion. And notice the indentation level here. It's not, this isn't Python where the indentation is important from a execution standpoint, but the indentation here is more for readability of the model to say, okay, all of these things are contained inside of a VLAN here. So I might have a list of devices now that this VLAN is, that are gonna participate in this VLAN. And inside of a particular device that I reference inside by creating a link to existing devices in the model, each device might have a, a couple of trunk ports or a number of trunk ports. It might also have a number of access ports. And then I can again express some constraints in here that say, well, wait a second, if a device and access port combination are already in use by another instance of my service, I wanna prevent that from being configured in this and I can pass on error messages that say, you tried to you know, use an access port that's already in use. Um, the other thing that I'll point out here is this bottom line, which ends up being pretty important and is generated by that skeleton code, but it's something called the service point, which is when an instance of this model gets instantiated, what is the handoff into that second layer of logic, right? And in our case, this is a Python uh, a logic that we're going to be applying here, so I can take a peek at the Python file that goes along with this, right? And you can see, I have a couple of different classes that get set up. Don't be intimidated by the code that I'm showing here. 99% uh, of this code was actually generated for me by the NCS make package. All I really did in here, and you, again, you can see this in the commit history, is I went in and created, just changed some, some quick strings to make this a little bit more easy for me to debug and, and check in my logs where I can see things that are more relevant to me or express them in, in terms that I want. This VLAN service point that was in our Yang file, this is the glue that actually associates this Python logic with the Yang model. So whenever an instance of that Yang model starts to get instantiated, this code is going to execute. And specifically, we're going to execute the create callback. The create callback is the only thing that's actually required in your service because of the, the capabilities of NSO in particular FastMap, we're actually able to create uh, or to model the other update and delete interfaces based upon that, that uh, um, you know, service model, right? And, and if we update, you know, we can dynamically figure out what needs to change to go on with that. And then finally, we have the templates that get applied here. And I've chosen to break my templates down into a, a, a little bit smaller and more manageable pieces. So when we think about this VLAN use case, there's kind of the aspect of it that says I need to create the VLAN and then I need to add some access ports to it and then maybe add some trunk ports to it. Maybe you, you don't wanna change the order or things like that, that's all fine. But at least this allows me to map it exactly how I would think about it as a network engineer in the sort of order of operations that go into provisioning these. And then the templates themselves become very, very small here, right? So again, here's that conditional loop that says my device, my service model is gonna have a number of devices in it. And those devices here, this is where the vendor independence uh, uh, you know, starts to go away because now we do need to have the, you know, the correct mapping that if this is an iOS device, here's the XML that we apply. If it's an NXOS device, here's the XML that we apply. Um, and I'll show you in a second here how I actually get to this. Um, but, but again, I'm not writing this from scratch, I'm generating it off of existing devices here. And then the mapping of when I iterate across all of these devices, NSO takes care of all of the rest of the conditionals that says, what type of device are you? Oh, you're an iOS device? Okay, I've got an iOS you know, template for you. You're an NXOS device, here's the NXOS. And adding new device types or new vendor types into this is extremely easy because I can simply add another block of XML under the same element here and then the, the rendering will happen for me automatically. 
So let's pop back over to our CLI here and let's actually go ahead and configure a VLAN based upon uh, our model, right? So you can see that I have now a VLAN and I'm gonna call this uh, Net DevOps. And in my Net DevOps, when I do my question mark, you immediately see here's that ID that we talked about. Here's the, the device key that we described in our model. So I'm gonna give it an ID here and we're gonna say ID 1000. And then when I do device, all of my tab completion and all of that is handled for me by NSO. I say, okay, I wanna add my device iOS one and my first port is gonna be my trunk port. And then maybe I'll have an access port in one slash two with a description server X. And then we'll also add in another NX1 device. And again, here, because we're still abstracted, I don't care about the semantics of what's the difference between configuring a trunk port on iOS versus NXOS. I'm just specifying that I want a trunk port on module one slash one. Uh, likewise, I can do another access port here, one slash two, description server X. And now we've, we've started to configure our service here, but like NSO, we get the ability to see what is actually gonna happen. And we can do that in a number of fashions. One is we can do the commit dry run. And you'll notice up here on the top right hand side of my screen, this is those logging messages that I was showing, right? And all I've done is change the strings to make things a little bit easier for me to read in my logging. And I didn't have to do a whole lot of setting up the logging infrastructure. I'm just a consumer of it, even as a developer. Now, as a network engineer though, I look at this dry run output and I can kind of get a sense for what it's doing, but this sort of looks a little bit foreign to me. And I, I want to say, hey, I need my network engineer to actually review what the automation is going to do. So I need to see what would it actually happen if this were to go out and touch the devices. And in that case, I can actually change the output format of my commit to say, I want to see what are the native commands that need to run to instantiate this service. And here it's going to generate for me all of the things that happen when that template gets rendered. So we're going to go in and we're going to define that same VLAN and we're going to specify a name. We're going to go in and we say on iOS devices, it's now a 10 gigabit Ethernet that we want to provision on our platform. And so we didn't expose the complexities of different interface types other than the module and port. And then we also understand that, hey, there's a switch port trunk allowed VLAN command that needs to be modified, but we're automatically taking into account any existing VLANs that were carried on that trunk and then simply adding in the additional ID that needs to be added to here likewise on our access ports, and then very similarly on our NXOS device. And once I'm done, I can go ahead and commit that change. Now, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit here because I'm you know, representing the network guy here, but I'm, we're also developers, so we get the same interface now. If I pop over to something like Postman, I can now uh, immediately, at once that service is rendered, if I could find my mouse pointer here, uh, look at it and make API calls against my service and I can immediately see that I have a consistent uh, view of the service configuration data right from a RESTful API. And if I want to see the rest of the gory details, I can even double click a little bit further and see that all of those same things are exposed in terms of you know, the way that I describe them in my model down to the fact that this, the reason that this is trunk dash port here is a function of, in my Yang model, I called it a trunk port. If you guys refer to in sort of your common parlance in your organization, you guys might call that an uplink or you might call it something else in sort of your vocabulary. And again, this is where we're decoupling that into describing it in the terms that you use so that we're all speaking the same language and there's no sort of back and forth about, well, what do you call a VLAN? What do you call a trunk port? What do you call an uplink, right? We've standardized and created a contract language for all of the stakeholders that describe how we're providing this service and are allowing them to use it in whatever manner that they want. So my ServiceNow developer can actually go in and configure a new VLAN here. So we're gonna create another one here called Servers 3 and we're gonna use a very similar thing here, but we're gonna go ahead and send that configuration down to the device and I can check and say, okay, it was created. Everything looks successful. Likewise, I may have an operational person that wants to use more of a GUI. Well, in the GUI that NSO provides, when I'm, when I'm describing my services in these models, 
This UI is also automatically rendered for me such that a, uh, an operations guy could come in and look at the configuration of this service three, see all of the devices, see the trunk port, see the access port, and maybe they just want to go in now and add a new port in here that's, you know, maybe one slash seven needs to be added to this VLAN. So I can go ahead and confirm that and I get all of the same capabilities. When I look at my commits here, it can evaluate for me what are the things that need to be changed. Again, I still need a network engineer to maybe review this configuration. So here's the change that was rendered for me. And when I go ahead, in fact, and commit all of this, it goes out and touches all of those devices. Now, I haven't even logged into a device yet because we're sort of automating and we want to get out of the business of automating, but let's actually take a quick peek at what happens on these devices. So we can see, okay, I've got a show running config and you can start to see here are all of the interfaces that I configured via these northbound APIs, but they did in fact get rendered down into uh, the devices themselves and we can explore that both from a device level but I'm gonna take this opportunity to show you one other feature that we talked about a little bit in the slides, which is the visibility aspect of this. So when I look at the show running config for VLAN server, uh, let's see, servers three, and maybe I wanna see that configuration, but now I also wanna see, well, what, you know, what type of configuration on a device did that render? I can look at devices, device, NX1, and config and X interface Ethernet one slash three. Oops. Uh, got a typo in here. Ethernet one slash three. And you can see I get a representation of it in NSO. Again, not very different than what you see from the native device. But the key here is by having this go through the orchestration layer, I have some of these pipe commands that are available to me where I can do things like say, well, what service is this configuration for? And now I have an annotated version of the same configuration showing me all of the services that that could potentially impact. In this case, this is a, just an access port, so it's a pretty much a one-to-one, -one. but what would happen if we looked at, say, the trunk port of this? And now I have the ability to say, what's sort of my blast domain? Because if I make a change to this trunk, I can see that it's gonna impact my net DevOps service, as well as my servers three service. And so I get that sort of visibility into where are the dependencies in my configuration. And this comes at the function of being able to, to model that in a way that, that we choose to and, and sort of express uh, all of those demos. And I'm gonna kind of end with one last demo because we have also the ability to say, you know, there's other tools out there. We think NSO is a great one, but what would happen if say, you know what, my DevOps team, they're telling me about how great Ansible is and they wanna use Ansible to provision their servers and their servers are, you know, need some network connectivity. Maybe they need a VLAN or maybe they just need an additional switch port turned up when they're, sp when they're pin uh, spinning up that server. So I can also use uh, something like Ansible modules that come as part of the core and I'll take a quick peek here at a simple playbook. And again, the thing I'm pointing out here is that there's a great deal of consistency in that API because we provided the contract language in the form of our data model. So now we have a, a, almost exact parity, albeit now we're going from maybe JSON or CLI into a YAML format. And what I find is really nice about this kind of Ansible plus NSO thing is again, it gives the choice of the technology to consume it. I can abstract the complexities from how do you actually go into all of the devices and issue a bunch of SSH commands, but then my, my playbook is very, very simple. So this is a, you know, a 50 line playbook which configures two VLANs here. So let's take a look at what happens when we, uh, when we load that up. Oops. So let's do, uh, let's cheat a little bit. So I don't have to type a long command here. 
And we see again, all of our logging and everything that goes on here, as we're configuring these VLANs, I'm getting that centralized logging that I've described in my, uh, you know, in my service package. And now they've consumed it in a very simple manner via an Ansible playbook, which is a tool that they're accustomed to. And so we have a tight integration with sort of all these other DevOps or config management tools as well that make it really easy for us to have an accurate representation of the entire network, both at the device level and at the services that we're providing back to our customers level. And we give the choice of the interface back to who is the user and what interface do they prefer. So we're not locked into, you gotta do everything in REST or you gotta do everything in Ansible. We have a, a solid foundation for us to build, you know, very, very robust uh, uh, automations on top of. So I hope that demo kind of helped clear it up. And again, that you know, I, I recognize that you know, provisioning a VLAN with a couple of ports and a couple of switches isn't necessarily the most exciting thing in the world. But what you should take away from this is that after I've developed that automation, whether it was two devices or 200 devices, by having it modeled and the templating engine and the logic that I've written once, I could easily take that same service and deploy it out to hundreds of devices and it's no skin off my back. So to summarize, what did we talk about, right? We, we, we talked a little bit about an NSO overview and review. And again, that was a very, very light overview or review. I'd highly recommend if, if NSO is brand new to you, taking a peek at last season's uh, episode where we talked about it for, in the terms of the devices and got a little bit deeper into some of the sync from and sync to operations. Uh, hopefully gave you a pretty good introduction to how, what's the service package and what's contained in it, how you think about designing service packages for your organization, and then how you would go about developing that. Um, there's a number of resources that you'll have here in your slides. Again, the sample code from today, highly recommend taking a look at that. Uh, download the, the free NSO evaluation off of DevNet and, and clone this code down taking into account that commit history that I mentioned. I think that'll be a, a good tool for you guys as you look at, well, how the hell did you get to the point where you were sh showing us this demo? You can review step by step by step all of the things that I did when I developed this simple service. And again, the simplest service isn't much different than a more complicated service. You're just iterating a few more times and making you know, a couple more changes into it and, and the, the model will scale and you don't have to worry about how many devices or how long is it going to take or how do I get parallelization across pushing configs out to devices. Um, so the link to the download, uh, some links to the documentations. There's also a good deal of learning labs and DevNet sandboxes available for you to start exploring this. Um, and if you're looking for more information about Net DevOps in general, uh, check us out on DevNet. Um, there's some blogs and uh, a lot of videos and things like that that'll help uh, get you started. And I'll end with, if you've got more questions, we've got a few more minutes here, Hank, if there were any questions. Otherwise, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and GitHub and stay in touch. You know what? There's actually one question that came in that I think is worth going through. Can you talk a bit about where, how does Git fit into the development pipeline and going through? Because the question was, if, we, if we're storing the code, the YAML files, the Yang, all the templates up inside of Git, aren't we then risking getting out of sync with what NSO actually has? And so how does all that fit into the workflow? Yeah, so I think it's important to divide between kind of two aspects of it, right? The first is, and I'll switch back over to my code base, like I pointed you to my GitHub repo, this Yang model, the Python and all of my templates that go into rendering that obviously get checked into source code, source control, and we can version control and see what changed when and who changed when in the actual automation uh, package itself. Then secondarily, there's sort of the configuration data that goes into, that we feed into this model, which, and th this starts to get into more of an infrastructure as code type of discussion where I'm describing not the semantics of the data, but the data itself for say VLAN 1100 or VLAN 1300. And that's where again, your choice of configuration management tools is, is a big part of that because if you're choosing infrastructure as code and you're adopting Ansible, then this Ansible playbook itself would get checked into version control as well. You can see in, in mine, I haven't actually committed this change or I've made a change to this playbook that I haven't committed yet 
but that itself would get would get committed alongside you know maybe alongside the package or in a separate repo that says here's the actual operational config of my network and when i feed these playbooks through you know for example this one said hey there's actually a change that needed to be made on the device if I were to run this same playbook again, we get item potency to say, oh, no, everything's configured great. So by having the source code for the service automation and the service package committed into version control and an Ansible playbook or a puppet manifest or a Terraform config file, whatever it ends up being that you're sort of integrating in from the northbound, all of those things can be checked in as, as artifacts too. Great. Well, thanks so much, Kevin. This was an excellent session, kind of diving deeper into and pulling the, the kind of the, the covers back on what a service is and what it offers to network engineers and application developers and other consumers that are there. And so for everybody that was with us today and everybody that's watching on video, thanks again for joining us with NetDevOps Live. We'll be back again next week with another great topic. Until then, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>